This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I am your host, Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, is my co-host, Fred Moreland. And Fred, we have a big announcement today. We are also starting our own reality show live after uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy. Yeah, I also think that if things keep going the way they're going, uh, Power Slap may be asking Voices of Wrestling to to air their show. Um, Yeah, uh... I, uh, that's, that is an announcement. And I mean, I like, technically it is a big announcement. I get it being called a big announcement and you can't disagree with it, but also I don't know if I want to watch that. <laughs> it, I, get, I never watched Rose to the Top. I don't even know if it was good. Like I was always like, ah, I should probably watch that. And I didn't. So it, I watched the first couple episodes. It was pretty good, but it wasn't enough to keep me going. Yeah. Um, I, I'll say this. I have no problem with them making the announcement, but I have a problem with them saying, Hey, we have a big announcement. And AEW has this history of everybody gets themselves worked into a shoot. And then the announcement just becomes this huge letdown. And I feel like this is just another one of those things where, oh, we think the mystery guy is going to be like Sabu or or somebody just huge. And it ends up being Brian Cage. Like, What, I, what, I, what, do, you, what can, do you mean uh, Tony Khan has not built a time machine to go back in time to bring back uh, in his prime Nick Bockwinkle? What a disappointment. Yeah, uh, Sanders, you know, I, I actually listened to a podcast about this uh, hosted by Voices of Wrestling's own Jesse Collings with uh, Rich Krejci as the guest about, uh, the, the you know, the three kinds of loud critics of AEW. And, um, look, I just don't think there's ever going to be a good faith take by a chunk of the online population regarding mm-hmm. AEW. And that's kind of, that's pretty frustrating. Yeah. Um, and but I do recommend it. it's called the Joe's podcast, which Jesse hosts on YouTube. And uh, I thought it was really interesting. Listen, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just that's just kind of how AEW discourse goes because I don't know what people want <laughs> sometimes. No, and you know, it, it's not even necessarily something about the discourse, it's there's a history of Tony building up these big announcements and then them just kind of being a letdown. Uh, and I, like I said, I think some of it is just we work ourselves into a shoot. But I, I just think he needs to tread water a little more carefully because as, as much as this is a big announcement, you're getting an extra hour of Turner Network time. That's yeah. that's big for a business model. That's huge yeah. for the future of their company. But AEW in, in the mud. In terms of what the fans expect from a big announcement at this point, I think you need to be a little bit more careful on how you approach these things because this kind of missed the mark a little bit. Um, I mean, yeah, but look, they're, they're, maybe I'm maybe I'm being a little too overcritical, but th- this is becoming a pattern. It's becoming a trend, and when it's becoming a trend, you you have to take something like this just a little bit more seriously. That sh- I just think he should, running. yeah, he should have just built it up. Hey, we have an announcement. I think using the word "big" sets a different kind of expectation, and he's had a history of doing this and it just being letdowns. And I. Maybe I'm being overcritical, but I, I feel like this has become relatively normal. I mean, when did they first? I think they first mentioned this on like Rampage at the very end of the show. And then, you know, they just refer to it a few times on Dynamite. I don't know. Like, is, should they be saying, you know, hey, Tony Khan will be on the air with a moderate sized announcement? You know, please adjust your expectations. No, just take the word big out of it. Tony Khan has an announcement on Dynamite. Yeah, like, it's it, part of his job to sell it, and I don't I have a problem it, with it. And it, it is a big deal for them to get another hour of uh, TV. It is a big deal for them, but how is it for the fan base? How is the fan base going to treat this? Are they going to treat this as the same big deal as for what the business side thinks? And to me, that I think just taking the word big out of it would would have separated the expectations enough because people were talking forbidden door 
they were they were talking uh, like a lot of different things and it ended up being a reality show um where they just go behind the scenes and it is is that a big deal in context of the broad scope absolutely but building it up like that i think he just needs to tread water and be careful and i'm not even a, i'm not an aw hater i love this company it we just seen this before uh, and again and again and i i worry that the next time could end up being a really really big hurt to the um the perception of the company i think most people that are reacting this way to this announcement are probably unlikely to watch or care about the show in the first place. Oh um, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about the bad faithers. I'm just talking conversation between you and me. I, I think he needs to be careful. I disagree, but I feel like we're going in circles at this point. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, this was, I think a big announcement, uh, you know, and if people expect him to announce signing the rock or something like, I don't know, that's kind of on them. All right, that's on enough, you, Tyler. Tyler. That's on you. I w- I wasn't even expecting anything. It's just I don't know that we're you're right. We're going in circles. Let's let's talk about something that's actually bad, and that it was the rampage numbers from last Friday. Ooh, buddy. Um, so they get moved, and we all know that when they get moved, that their ratings just go down. They that's the same with pretty much any television show. That's how it works. Yeah. But they went down more than they, this is the lowest rated show in the history of AEW wrestling. 287,000 viewers with 0.07 and 18 to 49 demo. And what's weird is they got moved before prime time. So this was a seven Eastern, six central time slot with that being the lead in to the NBA All-Star Game festivities. This is you really can't spin this any other no, way. They were, down, they were on 65 percent in the key demo. And 39% overall from last year's show, which also had a move time slot. This is absolutely brutal. But I think last year's time slot was like 11 p.m. Central, 12 Eastern. Mm, I'm um, not sure about that offhand. Uh, I just wrote down that it was a, a shifted time. Um, yeah, I but believe this number, it was that. Okay, then that's even worse. Uh, I actually, if you if you told me that they would be at 7 and um, have something affiliated with the NBA following it up, I, I mean, granted, it's... It was what the rookie sophomore game, which no one cares about at all. Um, like, I don't know, man. I would have expected it to not shit itself that bad, <laughs> but this is a this is a really bad number. Now, my my thing is always look at trends, look at uh, long term trends, and like Rampage has settled back to where it kind of was last like December, a few months ago, where we were complaining about it, and you know, like. But the numbers are above what they should really ex- be expecting for what is essentially a AEWB show or a minus show or whatever terminology you like of, um, you know, 400 to 500,000, you know, like, well, more than that in a normal slot, but that many viewers on a Friday night at 10 p.m. Um, I mean, I think in general, the numbers are fine. I don't expect the numbers to like scratch a hundred, I mean, a million ever in, in the short term. Uh, but, you know, this uh, this is a really bad number. Like, there, there's no, I don't even see a point in, like, trying to be optimistic about this. Now, it is a time shift, and that kind of, uh, that will affect things, obviously, but still, it's it's not good. It's actually bad. So it is actually bad. Um, and then that's why AEW will die. Uh, don't look at the fact that they have a third, a third show on Turner now. Um, the, the one thing, Fred, that would interest me, um, especially when we talk about like we talked about this a lot with like mm-hmm. I might, and I know Joe Lanza, um, of the flagship when he talks about it on his Thursday TV reviews, voiceswrestling.com slash Patreon. One thing he always looks at with the ratings is was there anything going on in the context of culture and current events? Um, like when the election was happening, um, AEW took a big hit because people were watching election coverage. And if I remember correctly, Biden wasn't officially announced as president for like a couple days. And that, yeah, there was days, a delay on that. Yeah, that delay really hit AEW's ratings hard. And this fan base has a pr- propensity to go with the culture. And if there's something going on, watch that instead and then look at, and then they'll watch later on DVR. So the DVR number spiked on those days. What I'm curious about is 
how were the DVR numbers for this rampage? Because it was a move time slot because um, not everybody like I'm central time. So 6 PM, not a lot of people get home in time to watch it. Now, obviously you have West coast time. I, I'm not entirely sure how that works with um, their live sports um, with the West coast feed, but I know like with dynamite, sometimes I'll have to watch the West coast feed um, because I missed the seven o'clock show. So I have to watch it at 10, but with live sports, how does that change? So it was rampage only available at that 6 PM time slot, which means anybody in mountain five to six, you're probably you yeah. muting from home and oh, in Pacific too. West I mean, coast is even worse. Yeah. So I would want to see the DVR numbers before I completely call this in total an abhorrent failure because on the surface it is, but I think we can get a little more granular and figure out how many people are actually watching the show and get a better scope of how bad it was. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's always a question of the pattern. So we'll see how the ratings do over the next couple of weeks when they get back in their normal time slot. Uh, I expect there won't be much of a change. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a bad number. Um, oh, I don't yeah. think it really means much as far as AEW's overall health. I think, obviously, first of all, I would put much more value in the Dynamite ratings than the Rampage ratings as an indicator for that. And I think the Dynamite ratings have been pretty good, other than I think there was a big drop last week. For, But that, again... Last week's trends, show was also bad. Yeah, that too. Uh, trends, not uh, single numbers. So Yes, you always want to look at trends. Um, speaking of trends, we have a trend of Ariel Helwani being a corporate shill and a <laughs> completely biased reporter i i can't even call him a journalist anymore based on um how he acts we we all know that uh, ufc was paying ariel hawani and now he appears to completely be on the wwe payroll he's not even and a real journalism no um it's quite frankly it's really unfortunate um because some of the stuff he used to do for ufc before any of this started he was very good and tony khan um, fired shots at him because um, Helwani just had him on for his podcast, interviewed him, and then, if you remember correctly, just threw absolutely, yeah, yeah, threw a fit and eviscerated him for not talking to him about Brawl Out. And we talked about it live at the time. It's like, dude, shut up, man. Like, <laughs> it's it's okay. Uh, and then after having that fit, he he's live on SmackDown as as like a an ex an extra voice and he's standing in the crowd and he's just being a, a fucking mark. And to do that after trying to be an quote unquote unbiased journalist and, do, and whining about Tony Khan, not answering any questions about brawl out when he told you he can't just, just disgusting. And then obviously Tony Khan went at him and Ariel Hawani had a, had, it just was like, um, super nice in response and then i i can't remember what tony tweeted back but it was it was something pretty funny um he just knew that hey this guy's not worth my time he got his one shot in and he was good but helwani equals joke yeah uh i again i've never been much of an mma fan um so like i never was regularly consuming his earlier stuff but uh i you know <sighs> I, I think that just the the standards for for wrestling journalists in general uh, are pretty low, and when you have the ones that actually do try to do the real work, like Dave Meltzer, Wade Keller, Sean Ross Sapp, etc., even Joe Lanza, um, on occasion, uh, I think it's really sad. Like ignoring those guys, obviously, because uh, they, you know, even for their things that kind of annoy me with like Sean Ross Sapp piping up stuff like that I don't care about as a separate thing on his Patreon, like the W the, the raw producers, like that will be a multiple tweet plug and I get the business, etc. but it also annoys me uh, just a little bit. Um, but like everyone else, uh, you know, it's like Ryan Satin, like, like, um, you know, Ariel Hawani has done a full Ryan Satin turn of just like being a complete shill. And I, you know, the next time there's a serious WWE thing, just expect Helwani to maybe more artfully, but still follow the same playbook that Saturn did, where um, Saturn was like, oh, I'm just too depressed by this news about Vince McMahon uh, sexually harassing uh, multiple women and settling with them to even talk about it. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry about your feels, man. 
yeah, just <laughs> this whole thing's just funny. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't stop laughing at it because Hawani has just become a joke. Um, but let's move on because I could, I could laugh at him all day. Um, let's talk about battle in the Valley for a little bit. And we had some AEW flair on the show. Um, Eddie Kingston faced Jay White in a loser leaves NJPW match. And the get there was kind of weird. Um, it was done on Brian Alvarez's radio show. Yeah. <laughs> or, or podcast, uh, I guess now, but whatever. Just very weird where they basically were just yelling at each other and they decided to make this a loser leaves New Japan match, which I mean, they've been building this up on strong for some time. So it wasn't like it was a, a complete uh, like this. This wasn't just like, hey, we're going to put two guys in a match at WrestleMania and then they're just going to sudden add stakes to it. No, this was a little bit more than that, but still adding the loser leaves New Japan match, especially with the fact that Eddie Kingston has such a reverence for the company and Japanese pro wrestling in itself felt really weird. And then Jay white just loses and you get yeah. no redemption arc, no thoughts of it. To me, this screamed, he was going to WWE, but I also wouldn't rule out AEW. Um, what were your takes on kind of the aftermath of this really interesting, but good match? Uh, as someone that is committed to being a not very good podcaster, I will just agree with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, like I just don't see another read on it, really. Like it's it, unless I mean, let's flip some other possibilities. And the only other one I can really think about is that he um, he's planning on doing a storyline with New Japan, uh, where he's trying going to eventually try to seek redemption later this year, but is going to largely this year chill out in Florida and show up at some. I don't know, impact tapings and go at half speed and um, like did last year. And um, I don't know. I mean, like that's about the only other option on the table. And I don't think that's a highly likely uh, circumstance. I mean, it'll be interesting to watch, but I do expect that, he, you know, he's probably done with New Japan and is signing with another company. Uh, the storyline with staying with New Japan is a possibility. Um and, you know, back when AEW was starting up, he told them that he had a seven-year contract. Uh, that was not seven years ago. <laughs> so is it uh, possible that he, you know, is is still under contract? Yes. Is it possible that there was a agreement to let him out of his contract or potentially like a option clause at some point? You know, like a, after three years, we have to agree to continue the contract or I don't know what. Uh, possibly, but... Again, I think those are less likely than just he's a free agent now. But no one knows until we find out. Yeah, it's I, I'm very interested to see what all happens here. But I, I think what's going to happen is he just ends up in WWE. And it's honestly going to be it's going to make the wrestling world worse off because I was really excited for a potential Jay White babyface run because I think and I think we talked about it last week. That is where you can actually see what the true potential of Jay White is because he's so good with the Switchblade character, but you don't get to see all of that in the ring because he works way too well to his character and his matches can be really hit or miss that way. He's never, I don't know if he's ever going to be able to get to a level of like a Kenny Omega as far as an in ring worker, but you have like, I mean, that's a you, rather high mark too, you I, know? but he's had like five-star matches. So oh, it's, yeah, not sure. like, it's not like we're comparing like apples to grapefruits here. Like I really think that he has the ability to be able to take work to another level, but he hasn't been able to quite get there. And I think like when you looked at Kenny Omega, when he went from his junior run uh, to really being the cleaner as the heavyweight, that's when we saw that work really pick up because he wasn't just being a shit bag heel anymore. He was being a real pro wrestler and then mm -hmm. you had that match with Okada at Wrestle Kingdom. They really kicked it off. And I was wondering if Jay White was going to be able to have a similar style uh, rise because the man's only 27 years old or I something know, like ridiculous. that. He's so young. And there's the potential for him to be able to grow so much in the ring as far as what he was able willing to do and not having to truly work to a, a gimmicky sh shitbag heel character. And if he just goes to the Fed, it's it's – we're all going to be worse off for it in the wrestling world. I'm going to take that time to take a drink of water because that's really uh, 
people. That's what the listeners need. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope he doesn't go to WWE in a selfish way, but honestly, you know, I don't know. I think he'd be a rather high level act in AEW. I don't think he'd be like instantly rocketed to the title world title picture, but um, but I guess we'll see. I mean, if he does go to has has a mini retirement in WWE for five years, you know, I guess the worst case scenario is him having some like occasional four star matches while I don't know being like the third heel on the roster or something. I guess we'll see. Uh, I don't know. I think he's got a lot of potential left to fulfill, despite having what I think objectively you have to call a a very successful career so far. Um, I just, I you know, I, I'm somewhat surprised that he's leaving New Japan. I felt like he may have actually been the best fit there in terms of getting a push. Um, but WWE and AEW will pay more, and perhaps he's chosen to get more money. Look, if if he's going to get that much more money and he gets to stay in the States, like it sounds like he wants, good for him. It's just, yeah. as far as being a wrestling fan, it's just going to be a disappointment. Um, all right, let's let's continue to move on. Um, the I do have fight- big news. Uh, uh, the latest Jay White tweet is a retweet of the LA Clippers welcoming Russell Westbrook to the team. So Interesting, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's uh l- let's talk about uh the Fight Forever video game that seemed to that it, it seems like we're never going to get a true release because it's been pushed back and back and back and back. Um Kenny Omega is one of the spearheads of the video game division of AEW obviously with his absolute love for video games. He blamed the delay in the release of the video game on needing a teen rating from the ESRB. Makes total sense because Mm -hmm. let's just be honest, when you when you watch the television product, the amount of blood, the amount of violence that you'll see on a semi regular basis. I mean, John Moxley bleeds every freaking week, Um, but that's also Moxley. Um, He's just old school like that. And I I can see like a a video game like, hey, you have a little too much blood or whatever. We're going to put an M rating on it. Well. Second, you slap an M rating on it, all of a sudden, 12, 10 year olds aren't going to be allowed to buy the game. And that's a lot of what your target market is going to be. You're going to want kids to be playing this game. And that's why that teen rating is so important. So, um, if that's really the, o- the only rationale behind it, okay, makes some sense. It's just annoying as hell. Yeah. I, I do think it's, it, it sounds to me like it is moving towards a 2023 release. I do think it's going to finally happen. Uh, did they get a little ahead of maybe teasing it uh, last year? Yeah, yeah, they did. Um, but you know, they're they're you know, it's, it's it's going back to the old Tony Khan. Does he promote things too hard? I mean, that's just what a promoter does. Um, they're launching a first time game in a series, you know, without someone, and it's a wrestling market where people largely have not been uh producing opposing wrestling games it's not like they've you know this is right after def champ for new york came out or something um so it's going to take some time to get that all built up and you know again i get it um but there you go yeah absolutely um paul white said he needed he spent 11 weeks in a wheelchair before getting his knee replaced oh man i would i would not want to be in a wheelchair for that long i'm i'm glad he seems to be feeling better. Um, I know he got his hip replaced a few years ago. Um, that just the trials and tribulations of being a four to 500 pound man and also a professional wrestler. Yeah. Uh, I just, I can't imagine. So especially some of the size of Paul white, uh, just trying to deal with that. I'm glad that he got his knee replaced and seems to be doing better. So that is good. Yeah. Um, AEW filed a trademark for mm. AEW Collision, and this is something that I was listening to uh, the Spears of Asians uh, show uh, from Voice of Wrestling's and Open the Voice Gate's own Iron Mike Spears. I, I I find this interesting. It seems like this might be a trademark for an Australia show. Um, th- there's the th- you can kind of go a lot of different ways with this, but that kind of just reading up on it and listening to him, it sounds like this might be something for like an Australia or UK show. 
Yeah, that's uh, obviously pretty interesting as to what that might be. I guess we'll see. Um, just something to keep an eye on going forward. Yeah, um, that's that's about it for that. And then there was some teaser on AEW Dark for, quote, QTV, unquote. Is that like a QT Marshall thing? I have to assume so, um, but I guess we'll see. Um, honestly, of all the, the low-card acts um, with a fairly limited ceiling in that QT Marshall tier, I think he has one of the best gimmicks, and I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be changing that necessarily, but I guess we'll see. Um, you think this yeah. is a Miz TV gimmick, like where he's gonna have his like own sh- little show on dark? You know, they played around with that a little bit back in the pandemic days with I think Britt Baker, uh, having a, a talk show for like three dark tapings or something. Maybe they're bringing that back, but I don't know. It doesn't feel like a very Tony Khan thing, but I guess we'll see. Uh, I think that that um, QT has the capability to, you know competently host such a thing and uh i don't know it's uh very weird and it's also on dark so you know yeah all right well that leaves us to talking about dynamite this was a much improved dynamite from uh last week abomination um, and last week's abomination was only like a five out of 10. So it wasn't even like a disastrous show, but anytime you compare something to um, literally Monday night raw, it's never a good thing. And I thought this show was not, nah, it was, it was good. I, I didn't feel like I wasted my time. Uh, what did you think? I liked the show quite a bit. It, it wasn't at the same level as like the ones preceding last week where we had like a, a super hot stretch. But this is like a seven and a half out of ten or eight out of ten show to me. Um, we had one great match and one very good sh- match that kind of, if it had a little more time, might have been great in the main event. Um, had some at least interesting promos, and we'll get to some of those. Uh, and uh, but I think in general, this was a much better. This this was not a as this was not really a show that bored me at any point, and uh, that's really all I can ask. Yeah, um, I yeah I thought it was good. Um, I I think one of the things that AEW has done a great job of establishing themselves with is hot openers, and we had a very hot opener here as AEW All Atlantic Champion, freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy faced off against his former best friend ROH Pure Champion Wheeler Yuta for the All Atlantic Championship. This was great. Um, they started off like um, Orange Cassidy offered the code of honor because they used to be. Uh, in a faction together. And then I I thought this was really fun. They kept doing like different styles of roll-ups, like the Mm seatbelt clutch, crucifixes. And then they eventually just went to war. And I thought this was very, very well done. Um, I'm wondering what they're setting up here because after the end of the match, um, Orange Cassidy hit, um, hit the Orange Punch and then hit Beach Break and then hit a really hard orange punch in order to get the win that he offers uh, a best friend hug and Claudio comes out and ends up taking him to the back. Are we setting up for something here? Are we setting up for a potential you to reverse turn back to the best friends? Are we setting up a, a feud or is, am I just trying to read too much into something that was really minuscule? I'm positive. No, I think this is actually fairly big uh, development stuff, uh, especially with Claudio. I'm positive that uh, BCC will be turning heel. Uh, I think after the uh, the pay per view, I think a big question is if Brian Danielson will be part of that because he's been pretty removed from the group uh, for the past couple months. Um, but I I think that they've been really teasing uh, that a heel turn for that group. And I think this is the first time that they really show that like Claudio is going to have a turn heel. Um, Yuta has been kind of a shit for a couple weeks, especially with the little build to this match and their promo on rampage. Um, And uh, I think he really played it up in this match um, with like a bunch of just like super aggressive eye gouging and stuff like that. Very, very much heel work. Um, so I think that's where this is going. I love this match a lot. Um, I th- I went four and a half stars on this, uh, which honestly, like I I can 
I have no problem with people being lower on it because I can feel that like maybe I went a quarter star too high or something. But I, I just love this match. I thought it had a lot of heat. I thought it was very intense. You know, when you get an intense Orange Cassidy match, like that's usually special, and I think it was here. Uh, and I think Yuta really uh, had a good performance in particular. Yeah, I really liked what I saw from Yuta. Um, they, it, he still needs a lot of consistent in-ring work, and I hope that he gets used a lot with ROH TV and continues to be used with AEW as well. He continues to need reps, and he's already a good in-ring worker. Mm-hmm. But you can tell that there's more meat on the bone, and I think the only way to get there is to continue giving him reps. And longer matches like this against good quality opponents are going to help extract that from him, potentially make him an even bigger star. I think I watched a lot of his indie stuff in 2021. I think that's the right year. Maybe I don't think it was 2020. There was a, a fair bit on like beyond. And I think he was like a, a challenger for like a top 50 worker in the world spot at that point in time. Um, granted that like, I'm talking about like being number 50 at that point in time, but he, he was very talented then. And it's not like he's regressed at all. I think it's just a matter of him getting the exposure to, to flex those muscles. But I think he's, he's great in ring. And I think he's really developed as a personality. I think that's been the biggest gain he's had in the past year. Um, I think he's really shown the ability to uh, both be a great baby face, like in his match against uh, MJF back in uh, Philadelphia a few months ago, and uh, also now be a great heel. Yeah, I, I think he's got a lot of potential, and I want to I want to keep seeing AW put him in position to keep extracting it and making it better. And then uh, let's talk the other side for a second. Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy has become a very, very good worker for this company. And yeah, or, I, Orange Cassidy, it's easy to overlook it just because of the gimmick, obviously. I mean, like, the gimmick is that he doesn't mm-hmm. care, and some people don't. Some people sometimes forget that it's a gimmick. Um, but this guy works hard, and he worked re- really hard last night. Um, like, you know, in the Will Ospreay match last year at Forbidden Door, got a lot of talk. And um, it is, you know, that was not a carry job by Osprey. I mean, Osprey was obviously the better worker in the match because he's like one of the three best workers in the world right now, minimum. Uh, but Orange Cassidy definitely held his own in that. And, and in this match, he was a great worker again. Uh, he can really go in the ring, especially when the circumstances call for it. And he's a workhorse. He's been doing a lot of uh, high, you know, fairly high profile matches, granted most of them on Rampage. But, you know, having pretty darn good matches on a regular basis. Yeah, he's he's been... I don't remember the last time there was a bad Orange cast. Oh, I don't know if I've ever... Seen. I mean, I guess if you want to count the eight-man last week, but that wasn't like a bad Orange Cassidy performance. That was just, this is structured like a WWE house show. Mm-hmm. You know, mid-card match. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on. The next segment was Renee Peckett backstage with Hangman Adam Page and Evil Uno. Page... Um, in the course of this interview asked, I've asked you evil Uno to stay out of this so many times. And Uno's like, you're right. But you know what I hear? Dark order is not on your level. So please don't get involved in my match tonight. And this was really good from Uno. And he delivered a lot of good stuff entering this match. And we'll talk about the match later. He delivered there too. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that Uno also cut a, a very good promo on rampage last week. Look, I think, Uno, uh, you know, obviously his shortcoming is, uh, you know, he's not the best in ring performer, especially if it's, uh, you know, a longer batch. And, you know, his physique is what his physique is. But the guy has a lot of skill. And I, I'd be rather, ha- I'd be pretty happy if, like, he actually got something of a push coming off of this, because I think he definitely earned it. He had a great showing. Um, I mean, these promos alone were like, they actually made me want to see Uno have this match and win. Like, they were both very good babyface promos. Uh, so, kudos to him for, for building this. I mean, he really did his work on, on building this match up. And I know that, like, when you just look at it in the abstract, player Uno, or I'm sorry, evil Uno versus John Moxley in a main event on Dynamite is going to look weird, but this did not feel out of place, you know? It, 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 I, I was reminded of like when Brock Anderson main evented against Malachi Black, and that was just a squash to build the Cody angle at the time. And, and that fell out of place, and it still does. Uh, Uno was not out of place in this spot. No, Uno was not out of place, and he did 
he did a great job uh, maximizing everything. And we'll get to that uh, towards the end of Dynamite because that's when that came around. Let's talk about this next. Uh, Absolutely, Ricky Sarks comes to the ring and he Steve says, it ain't no secret the fast few months have dealt with interference from the Jericho Appreciation Society. To me, the message is very clear, Chris. You do not want to have a rematch with me, so I accept that. He says he'll be moving on from Chris Jericho, but he has an open challenge and he pulls out a contract from his coat. And then Chris Jericho walks to the ring and that he's like, now, Rick, you know what you're trying to do. You're trying to bait me. And it's not over um, until I say it's over. And he says, good luck with the open challenge. And then pretty Peter Avalon comes out to accept the open challenge. Avalon gets in Jericho's face and he's wearing the pain maker jacket with a bunch of spikes and hits Avalon with a Judas effect that wouldn't shock me to poke down an eye. Um, and then he ends up going and accepting uh, Ricky Sark's challenge. What did you think of this? I, you know, this was the WWE style segment. Um, you know, not typically what you would see on AEW, but it's a very Chris Jericho style segment. So, but it's fine because they're sports entertainment shit bags. Yes. Um, and honestly, look, I, I saw some people say that it went a bit long. Can't disagree. I mean, maybe it did, maybe it did. It was on the precipice for me. But I will say that I think the length allowed it to hit some notes that I appreciated. Um, I, I appreciated like the the Peter Avalon wanting to come out for the, the the match because that makes sense in kayfabe. Like this guy that isn't really doing much sees an opportunity and goes to take it. You you never see like in WWE, you know, when they do an open challenge thing like you know Akira Tozawa or someone at that level of a non push like running to the ring and being like, hey, please give me a chance. It's always like a, a high card guy. Um, and I thought that was a nice touch here. I really liked the fact that Jericho was getting artfully manipulated by by Ricky Starks through this entire segment. And it really played into the character of Chris Jericho just being a total egomaniac. And, you know, despite it being obvious, I think, to most people what was going on, him not even considering the possibility that he was getting played, I thought that was good character work. Um I thought Ricky Starks, uh, immediately after Jericho turned around to leave the ring, uh, smirking and winking at the camera, I thought that was a fantastic little touch. Um, so I I liked the segment. Um, I thought it was entertaining. I thought it was a nice change of pace. And uh, I would I don't necessarily want something like this on my show every week, but this was this was a good, unique uh, segment that really helped uh, further this feud and helped elevate uh, Ricky Starks. I think. I think overall that this was really good, but being it, it felt a little long and convoluted. Yeah, sure. I what I it, I think the whole point of this was Ricky Sarks was supposed to trick the heel Chris Jericho yeah. into doing it, and I, I felt like this this could have been accomplished in a much smarter way. Um, like you say, like oh, I get you're not going to. Okay, it makes sense. And then Chris Jericho comes out and is like, yeah. Good luck. And like to me, that that part was the least concerning. I would have liked it better if Peter Avalon had just come out and then Jericho just attacks and be like, "Nah, fuck you. You're uh, uh, Starks. You're trying to just completely ignore me." No, I say when this is done, and I I think they could have gone from point A to point B a little smoother. But I don't hate this. It's it's a sh- it's a sports entertainment segment from the sports entertainers. Uh, mm-hmm. it, I think I think it worked. I don't think it hurt anybody, and I'm still excited to see this match. Yeah, I, I think it actually helped heat it up a little bit. Uh, before this, like I thought it was just kind of a average build, nothing particularly special for a few weeks. Uh, but I, th- I thought this did heat it up a good bit, um, and uh, I'm more excited for it now than I was before. Uh, so, yeah, I like this a lot. I like the the little callback to the list with the pin. I like the fact that even Jericho was like, uh, you know, oh, well, if I had a pin, I'd sign this. And then, like, smirking like he got out of it, and then Stark's you know, playing along, going, oh, that's a shame. Well, damn. But I got a pin. Like, I thought that was delivered perfectly. Um, also, Excalibur on commentary made me laugh pretty good by uh, I've never been, uh, never been before has bureaucracy ever been so exciting. I, uh, I got a good <laughs> chuckle out of that. Uh, but I like this. I, I thought this was a, a really well structured segment. Yeah. Um, let's, let's move on. Next segment had the acclaimed with daddy ass come out and face the firm's big bill and Lee Moriarty. And 
my biggest take from this match is we need more Big Bill on television. Big Bill rules. And uh, you just look at him. He's He is built so abnormally to every other human. And, like, the, the dude has, like, he's, like, barrel-chested with a six-pack. Yeah. He's a massive, massive man. And I, yeah. we need to see more of him. And you could tell Lee Moriarty's just not ready. Um, but it's not necessarily his fault. He's incredibly talented. He's just, he needs more time. And this was basically just a heat segment for the acclaimed. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I thought, uh, I thought Morardi was, uh, perfectly fine here. Uh, you know, he was just being the workhorse in a heel tag team that would eventually eat the uh, pin. And he did. Uh, I thought he would look pretty solid. Uh, I like his ring work. Um, so I don't know. What did, what did you see that you wanted more from him or better from him in this? Oh, I, I, I guess I'm not necessarily talking in like a, a singular sense. I'm just talking in a general scope. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, do, I do agree that he has room to improve for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying he's like a complete, you know, package at this point in time, but I, I thought he did pretty well here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, what this segment was really designed for was one to, to keep um, heat with the acclaimed and get them ex- uh, ready for their four-way tag team title challenge at Revolution, but Tony Schiavone then comes to the top of the stage to interview Christian Cage about his return to AEW, and as Cage comes out, Jungle Boy Jack Perry attacks him and ends up taking him down and gets him set up for a concerto, and Jungle Boy then hesitates. And he's just not not quite willing to do it. And once he finally decides he's going to, Cage gets him in the nuts and then busts his head wide open. This was a really good way to keep that feud going. I what what I find interesting is the timing. Why didn't you wait a couple weeks until like after Revolution to get this going? Because this isn't going to be on the Revolution card. And you you could have waited a little bit and continued to build Revolution. Like I don't know. It, Am I wrong here? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think they're going. I think they're going to do it on the pay per view. Um, I like this segment. I thought that uh, I, I love Christian as a heel. I mean, he just really is great at that at being just a completely unlikable scumbag. Um, I, I didn't have any issues with this. You know, I think that uh, my presumption, of course, is that next week we'll get the big challenge and they'll set up a match and it'll be like the, I don't know the. Six biggest match on the show or whatever. Yeah. I I just feel like they'd be rushing a little too much to do it on Revolution. Maybe. I, Maybe, I guess that's, but... that's my argument. Um, but I also don't know where what direction they want to take this. And I think that's going to tell us a lot about... Um... All right. Um, let's do this. Uh, next segment, Sky Blue versus Soraya with Tony Storm. This was basically just a heat segment. Um, mm-hmm. You get the Soraya using Tony Storm to cheat to beat Sky Blue. And then as they're about to spray paint Sky Blue, they come out, or uh, Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter come out. And as Soraya and Tony Storm are about to leave, Ruby Soho's music hits, and she stands at the top of the ring. And then she does the whole um, the belt Aaron motion. Rogers belt motion. Yeah. And says that she wants the title shot. And we find out later in an interview backstage with Jamie Hayter, she's going to defend it against both Soraya and Ruby Soho, which that match could be good. It could be a disaster. Um, I'm very intrigued. I think, yeah, that'll be really interesting to watch. I think Ruby's been doing pretty well in the ring since her return from injury. Uh, I think Soraya's looked okay. Uh, like not bad by a stretch, but okay. in the, her, her few matches, you know, building up to this. And of course, JV Hater is like on a fantastic hot streak. Uh, so that'll be interesting to watch. I think this was fine. You know, there, it's still kind of, it at least has some advancement in the storyline. Unlike last week when we complained about how there wasn't. And uh, I think this did a better job than, uh, you know, Ruby Soho standing in the ring you know, not wanting to literally be torn in one direction or the other. Yeah, this is this is going to be very interesting, and I'm I'm very excited to see how it turns out. I'm not a big fan of three ways, um, but 
I think with the context of the story, I think we're going to get something from Soho at the end of it. And I think that's going to, you know what? Wouldn't surprise me if we get a Mercedes Monet debut here. And I know, I know we've been talking, you know, ad nauseum about the fact that a Mercedes Monet debut, but a two woman faction just seems too small. Would you debut Monet in that spot though? Is that how you would use her? No, I would I would make her debut a really, really big deal, but yeah, that's kind of my I, take on it too. They they need something from this. They really do. And they need a third. Yeah, and maybe it'll be Soho. Um maybe not. I don't know. Uh I, I don't think that this has been this has been far from the best of AW uh, as far as the storyline. I think it's been getting closer, generally speaking, to like solid in terms, especially of where Soraya is being used, because I really don't think that she uh, worked out particularly well in that first feud with Rip Baker. Um, but I'm also not particularly juiced for this, you know, at this point in time. I, I'm very intrigued. I want to see where the story goes. The match could care less about. Um, this was an all timer uh, ahead of the 60 minute Iron Man match. We had American Dragon Brian Danielson come out, and as he's talking about um, everything, MJF comes out and just talk and ends up talking about real life stuff and how um, his ex left him, and the only thing that mattered to him was this title. And uh, he ends up bringing his um, uh, Danielson's family into it, and I thought this was interesting. Um, every time you step your foot in the ring, you say wrestling is more important than your family. You're spitting in my face with, because you're talking, you're taking everything I kill for for granted. You're worse than William Regal because you're addicted to the spotlight. I'm going to punish you for everything you've taken for granted. And then Danielson's like, don't you dare bring my children to this or I'm going to kick the shit out of you. While he goes into the ring, he said, I'm going to make dad that pay for all his selfishness. I'm going to make sure dad, I can never play with you again. Uncle Max is going to take his fist and hit dad at over and over again. And I'm going to give him a present on March 5th. I'm going to give him a gift. Early onset, CT. And then right as he says T, Danielson just jumps him and they have an all -all brawl. And I thought this was great. Um, There were some people saying that this was a little long in the tooth. Not not in a dissimilar fashion from the Chris Jericho, Ricky Stark segment we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought this was tremendous. Um, MJF is is kind of getting a little cartoonish, but he's also still real. Um, he just over exaggerates everything because he's a shitbag heel, and that's what you do. Um, I thought this was great. Another uh, feather in the cap for MJF, and then I cannot wait for this match with him and Brian Danielson. Yeah, um, Sean Ross Sapp did actually tweet a uh, confirmation that. Uh, MJF relatively recently, I think, separated from his fiance. Um, oh, so that, that was an alley catch they were talking about. I don't think so. I think that was his more recent one. Uh, again, judging off of what Sean Ross Tapp said. Um, so, like, I think there was a lot of a lot more realism in that than I initially realized because I also assumed that it was calling back to when he was dating uh, Alley Catch uh, or Alley Cat, and. Um, but, you know, uh, it appears to um, be... Oh, hold on. I'm alone. I lost Tyler. Tyler, you're back. I, I don't know what happened. Um, I'm here. Hey. Um, yeah, so I, I, I didn't make any progress whatsoever. I was just stammering over myself <laughs> because I'm really bad at audio. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think this was... Uh, act, you know, this was relatively good. I do... I don't really like it when people like use, you know, I consider it suicide as part of a storyline, but I'm uh, giving this some leeway because there's possibility that there's some truth in that too, uh, which I hope not. Um, I honestly hope that uh, MJF, the person is doing well, but once this got physical, this was a really good angle. Um, and I like this a lot. I thought the promo was pretty good, especially when he got fired up towards the end. Um, so, yeah, uh, I like the segment. I didn't love it, but I liked it quite a bit. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same uh, page with you. It was objectively good, um, but it was fine. Um, right after that, we had the segment I mentioned earlier with Jamie Hayter and Dr. Brett Baker, where Hayter lays out the challenge for the three-way. Um, 
she, basically she said, I think Soraya is deserving of a championship match, but I also think Ruby Soho is too. So let's have some fun revolution, make it a three-way match. Boom. Um, but I think what's most important here is we had this revolution tag team battle royal. Participants included um, Lo- La Faction Go Bernable, Roosh and Preston Vance, Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal, the Lucha Brothers, Butcher and the Blade, Top Flight, Best Friends, Dark Orders, John Silver and Alex Reynolds, Angelo Parker, Matt Menard, 2.0, um, Arya Davari and Tony Nice, and Aussie Open, Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis. Um, it's I a shame was, they didn't have them do anything. <laughs> I know. They were just, honestly, they were just there um, because what we found out later was we're getting Aussie Open versus the Young Bucks on Rampage. It, that's going to put butts in seats, baby. Um, I'm I'm a little surprised they didn't save that match for potentially like next week's Rampage, where it's like the pay per view. But mm-hmm. I also understand it because do you want They're a Young here. Bucks? Do you want a Young Bucks match one week before the pay per view? Eh, I mean, or one day before? Maybe not because they're going to be going up against you know House of Black, which we ended up finding out later, right after the segment. Um, I thought this this tag team battle royal was fun. I liked the stuff at the end with uh, Trent um, and Orange Cassidy and Jeff Jarrett stays winning. Um, we have a question from the Discord, Fred. Yes. We have four of them this week, if you can oh, believe shit. it. Um, Spontaneous has two of them in his first one. He asks, how loud will the boos be at Revolution with Jeff Jarrett becomes AEW Tag Team Champion? I don't care who's booing. I will be cheering. Jeff Jarrett is Tag Team Champion. Sounds fun as hell. And you know what? Like it's Jeff Jarrett, and we all think of Jeff Jarrett mainly from his TNA run, where he he just beat everybody to oblivion, and they ruined Monty Brown, which could have been one of the biggest things in wrestling. Um, Jeff Hardy had like four straight title failures challenges. Like I, I get that, but Jeff Jarrett is fun. He's having a good time in this company, and he's not being overpushed. He's just allowed to be the shitbag that he is, and I think it's. It's great. And with the tag team division the way it is, I think it would be really cool to have Jarrett and Lethal be champions for a little while and have a team like Declaim Chase. Yeah. Um, honestly, I thought that the the end result of this match coming up on Revolution for a few weeks would be neither the Airclaimed or the Guns walking out with the title so that they can spend that feud off away from the belts. Um because at least the acclaimed don't need the belts. I don't know that they're really particularly helping the guns at this point in time. Um, I will tell you, you won't be happy. My wife, uh, she absolutely despises Jeff Jarrett in the go away heat kind of way, um, which is very funny to me. Um, just because, like, I, I I think that they're be, they've been doing great stuff, and she's just over there. Like, I don't want them on my TV. I wish this wasn't a thing. It doesn't entertain me. Um, just interesting to see. Um, but I, you know, I thought this was the battle royal itself was like fine, not to particularly noteworthy really for much outside of Mark Briscoe running in and going after Mark Sterling and uh, that causing Tony Nice's uh, elimination. Um, and also the way Aussie Open were just dumped like geeks by the Butcher. Um, <laughs> And the blade, like, just real quick, uh, like it was, you know, I don't know, pick a low card tag team here. Uh, it did not feel like it was a big deal that they were in the match at all or that they were threats at all. Um, they didn't really get a shine any, and it that that was all really weird to me because I usually Tony Khan takes better care of his uh visiting guys, you know, even if they're you know here just as a, a favor, or whatever, like. They will lose, sure, but they won't like look like geeks on the way here. And honestly, I don't think that Aussie Open uh, came out of this looking particularly good. I know they'll look better for Rampage, but you know, still like Dynamite's going to be watched far more. You could have at least given them some viability as like looking like threats for a solid chunk of this match. But regardless, yeah, it's. <clears throat> I don't really have anything else to say about it. This was a non-embarrassing, relatively fun battle royal where they should have done way more with Aussie Open. I think that's, I think you that's said probably it well, the biggest flaw, you know, with the whole thing. Yeah, it definitely the biggest flaw. But 
it is what it is. Um, then we have the massive announcement where he passes it to Adam Cole. And he said that the same night that All Access debuts, he will be having his return to All Elite Wrestling, um, which I think is is a great way to kind of frame it. Um, not only do you get the return of Adam Cole and Ring, but then probably literally right following the match, you're going to get AEW All Access. So I like how they framed it. And they're trying to almost portray it as kind of like a double main event, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I, I thought this was uh, well thought out and a better use of Adam Cole's return than as like the fifth most important thing on a pay-per-view. Because uh, they're obviously like, they want to line him up as a main eventer and the crowd is strongly behind him if you listen to the reactions whenever he comes out or if he's on TV. Um, but this was, uh, I thought this was a solid little segment. We already have a discussion about like, should it be a big announcement, uh, how to label it. Uh, but I thought this was a, a good promo from Cole. Very good. Um, now we go to the main event. John Moxley versus Evil Uno. This was great. This guy's this juicy. Was, this was great. Evil Uno was bleeding a gusher. Oh, yeah. Um, and then as uh, Moxley was getting the bulldog choke, you literally saw blood gush from Evil Uno's oh, God, yeah. It was phenomenal. Um, Evil Uno's performance in this was awesome he was emotional he was very mad at how moxley had treated one of his best friends he fought that way he just tried to beat the living piss out of moxley he was doing topes no it wasn't tope he jumped off it, the top rope uh, yeah senton off the top rope to the floor which yeah. is a hell of a move for someone that size to be doing in particular um this was hey i know i'm in a big spot and i'm gonna deliver oh he, he stepped did. up he, he definitely oh. stepped up uh, and props to him for doing that. Yeah, um, that's incredible. Um, I think I think I went four and a half on it. I don't care that it was like eight minutes. It didn't have to be a long period of time. It was legit great. It was probably helped by it. Uh, because like Uno is not like, look, he's he's not built for stamina, you know, and that's OK. Uh, that's why most of his career was uh, as a tag team guy, because, you know, he could lean on Stu and uh, Stu is a great worker who, uh, you know, like has the skills to be a, a high level star just in terms of in ring work. Uh, but as an act, you know, Uno would get the heat and uh, be the power, and then Stu would do the rest of it. Um, I think Uno here looked really good. He there was one spot where he looked like maybe he got a bit blown up, like doing the two corner avalanches on Moxley. Like after the second one, he seemed to be breathing a bit hard for a second, but like that's so minuscule. Uh, this was overall, I thought, just fantastic. Uh, I only went four stars on it, which maybe I'm too grumpy with that or something, but I thought it was just fantastic. And if it went like three more minutes and, uh, you know, had a, just a little more of a tease that Uno would win or something, like it might have been even better. Uh, but I do think they really did uh, go out of their way to like, Give him a lot. He got a ton out of this match. And um, yeah, I thought he he 100% delivered. Moxley let him shine a lot, uh, which was very, you know, that, that said something to me right there. Uh, and I liked it. I liked it a whole hell of a lot. Yeah. Um, I Now let's talk about Music Gate. Uh, oh. <laughs> at, <laughs> So, okay, so um, this had the entire office slack confused um, until somebody um, who lives overseas was, it was watching the Fight TV version because with the Fight we, TV We didn't version, get the UNO entrance with the music or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was new Dark Order music. And when Hangman came out, they played the new Dark Order music, and they're like, wait, did they change Hangman's music? No, you can't do that. That's yeah, because like, that's one of the best themes they have. Yeah. It's a tremendous theme, and Hangman ends up coming – from backstage and then beats the piss out of uh, Moxley. And this was just great. I'm really excited for the Texas death match. And this was tremendous. Um, well done segment by everybody. Yeah. Uno really stepped up to, if, if he had not stepped up, this whole thing would have flopped and it was all on his shoulders to make this work. And he delivered. And uh, again, kudos to him, like a, a great performance from a guy you normally would not count on to deliver. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the one of the really nice things about this company. Um, they uh, 
they give guys opportunities to deliver in big spots. And usually those guys deliver in big spots because they're given that opportunity. I thought this yeah. was very well done. Um, let's touch on uh, the future of Rampage here. Um, we do have a lineup for this Friday. Um, Action Andretti facing off against Sammy Guevara. House of Black is going to call out the elite. Um, Willow Nightingale versus Tony Storm. We're going to get Lance Archer in a squash. And I, this is one I'm very intrigued by. Um, how it's going to go action Andretti versus Sammy Guevara. I think that could go a lot of different ways. And I think I'm most intrigued about that match while young bucks, Aussie open is probably going to be a a four and a quarter, four and a half star match. Yeah. I'm curious to see how much star, how much time they'll give that because they've announced the typical rampage lineup of four matches. One of them being a squash, um, and so based off that, like they'll probably get 12 to 15 minutes in ring time, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, Let me ask you a question. Um, do you think they'll have Aussie open beat the young bucks as a, a, and use this as a precursor to get Will Ospreay back in the States to face off against Kenny Omega? Because it, if Aussie open wins, that sets them in, li- it's like an eliminator. It sets them in line for a trios title shot. And then that's another way to get Osprey facing off against Omega. And then you can maybe do that at Forbidden Door. I mean, we've talked about Kenny Omega potentially winning the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. So then Will Osprey can just take him, take it from him at Wrestle Kingdom with how he's kind of built up. If I can't beat him within a year, I'm done. Odie, you're fine. <laughs> Don't be running. The, yeah, the, the wife got up and uh, Odie is excited. Um, he, he's not used to her still sleeping. He's used to her being gone, uh, when I get up. So it's, it's a little different, but, um, I, I I think that could be an interesting gateway to kind of continue the storyline and get us here. Yeah. I I mean, it's a possibility. I just think the timing's wrong. I think they're obviously building immediately in the immediate time to uh, the house of black. And I think that, um, they'll probably have the young bucks win to keep them heated up for that match. Uh, is my take. And you know what? You could very well be right, but I think action Andretti, Sammy Guevara has the widest range of outcomes yeah, it does. on the show. And I think that's why I'm most intrigued about it because I don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be Sammy Guevara being Sammy Guevara and he's not going to be able to help elevate this young guy. And how is the young guy going to do against an opponent that can't necessarily carry him? Like I mean, Chris Jericho is one of the best that's ever, ever worked professional sure. wrestling. Yeah, so, and, he, and that match was laid out perfectly. Yeah, and, and Andretti did his part incredibly well. Mm-hmm. But if things start to go awry, which we've seen in Sammy Guevara matches, how is that how is that going to be handled? How is Action Andretti going to deal with it? I think this is going to tell us a lot about Action Andretti. And to me, that's that makes it so intriguing. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I think there is uh, some potential for uh, maybe some ugliness in this, and that could uh, actually tell us quite a bit about how he is as a performer. Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to watch for sure. Um, I want to go back to last week's Rampage, which you told me not to watch, and uh, <laughs> I want to know why you wanted to deprive me of a pretty good TV show. It, it, I, I was just saying it, it really wasn't worth your time. It was fine. Um, I thought the the elite versus top flight was kind of an abomination. Really, um, I, there was a okay, lot so, of comedy in this. There was a lot of comedy. Let me let me explain. Let's paint the picture. If you didn't get a chance to watch Rampage, you have like it starts off. You have top flight coming out. They've got basketballs. They've got shirts with numbers on them. Their names are on the back. And obviously, it's corporate synergy with the NBA All Star Game. Makes total sense, right? I have no issue with it. The issue I had is like, look. You've got Top Flight versus the Elite. I don't want some stupid Toro Yano comedy. I've got Toro Yano for that. I love Toro Yano. I may be the world's biggest Toro Yano fan. That's not what I want when I see the Top Flight versus the Elite. I want high-flying, great wrestling. They do a tip-off to start the match. And then they have, uh, what is it, Um, Dante Martin throw a ball right at Kenny Omega's nuts. Like, that's not what I want from these guys. And I was just so jaded by it. Like, come on, just give us a, a straight wrestling match. Have it be four and a quarter. Have Omega just destroy AR Fox with a one wing angel. And let's get out of here. No, we had the we had the comedy bullshit. You could have used best friends for this. You didn't have to use Top Flight. And I guess to me that that was my biggest gripe is this could have been so much better. 
and it wasn't because of the corporate synergy. Well, and the comedy they played off of that. Yeah, you're not wrong the at comedy all. Comedy itself was good, and I'm not even complaining about the fact that it was bad. I don't, I don't want to see it from Top Flight versus the Elite because they can, they could have a five star match if they put one together well enough. Yeah, uh, I, I do think that the second half, like the post commercial part of this match, was actually quite good and helped cancel out the. You know, the, the goofiness of the first half for me. But By that I point, I was it. out of it, though. I well, was, that's fair. I, I, I get that. I, I can. St- I don't think there's anything wrong with that being you, your take or anyone else's. But I think the, the home stretch was, was good um, and uh, definitely worth watching. If you know that you won't like that stuff, then fast forward through the, the first half of the match, the first commercial break. Um, and it's not that I, I don't like dislike that stuff. I love comedy stuff, but... I didn't want it from this. Yeah. I was excited for this. Um, we talked about it. Like this rampage has a legit chance to be better than dynamite. Just if you look at the card and then I was so let down, I was just out of it for the rest of the show. I'm just like, man, I, I was just really disappointed. And I think what that's let me down more. Point. What let me down more was the crappy finished, uh, Swerve Strickland, uh, Dustin Rhodes, like just an outright WWE style. We don't want to have an actual finish here. DQ. Um, that I think was far more disappointing to me than uh, all the comedy in the half, first half of uh, Young Bucks or I guess Elite uh, Top Flight. Um, I thought that just stunk. Um, you know, and you have like there was you didn't even have to do that. You could just have Swerve cheat to win or something, and then proceed with a post match like you did uh but instead we got just this like dustin rose doesn't need to be protected from taking a fall you know especially in this circumstance against a heel who would probably cheat like i thought that was genuinely like just pointless and dumb uh and one of my least favorite things i've seen from aw in a little bit um i thought garcia and starks was solid like i went three and a half stars on it i i wished that it was a little bit more uh but it was pretty good and uh, I mean, despite my complaints, I still think Rhodes and Swerve were uh, ha- was a very solid match, and I also went three and a half on that, despite the bad finish. And I think Keith Lee's return was cool. You had a very good uh, Evil Uno pre-tape here uh, on the show too, um, and I also liked the Wheeler Yuta Orange Cassidy setup too. So all in all, I thought this was like a, a seven out of ten show. So you you did think it was better than Dynamite? All right, I, I did. I, yeah. I'll be honest. I was so taken out of it by by that comedy stuff. I I really can't rate the show. I was just that's fair. I was I was super annoyed. But it, that's a personal thing, and I'll just we'll chalk it up at that. No, that's um, fine. Before. That happens sometimes, man. Like you don't have to apologize for that or anything. But yeah, um, before we get out of here, we do have three more questions, Fred. Sure, yeah. You ex- let's get excited. Um, Spontaneous has a second one because he asked about Jeff Jarrett earlier. Um, will AEW All Access, despite whatever it ends up being, quell some concern with Warner Brothers Discovery not supporting AEW? While it's in a bad time slot, TBS did not need to give AEW more time. Um, what I find interesting about this, he calls it a bad time slot. I don't think it's a bad time slot. It's at the it's at the back end of prime time on Wednesday night, and it gives AEW three hours in prime time every Wednesday on TBS. Yeah. So. I, I, I kind of see where spontaneous is coming from because we we call Rampage a bad time slot. It's well, only that's a Friday bad night. time slot because it's Friday night. Right. Um, like 9 p.m. is kind of the best time slot if you think about it because people are still watching 10 p.m. Eastern and now you have like 7 p.m. Pacific time. Everybody's at home. So mm-hmm. now it's a good good spot for prime time. Um, like I, I think, I don't know if it will quell concern that they don't support them but i i do think that this is a because i think the people that say that they don't support them are all bad faithers to begin with um but i do think that it, it's a continued step in a positive direction for a potential extension once contract season comes around for aw yeah it's a pretty obvious good sign for aw uh i do think there's been a lot of concern and not for bad faith people about the status of aw and their next tv deal i think melzer has been pretty concerned about it uh but the fact is like look even if they sign for the exact same amount of money that will be let's not be confused it'll be a massive disappointment oh yeah 
but that doesn't mean that they will close. Like they're making money right now. I think that last, well, was it last year or the year before that they would have made a, it's been reported that they would have made a profit except that they made a pretty massive investment in this video game studio or video game deal that they're working yeah. on. Yeah, w- um, which is fine. Yeah, that that's as a business, you invest money. That's how this shit works. Yeah, um, like you're talking year three of the business. Year three of the business mm-hmm. isn't profitable only because you're reinvesting massive amounts of money into more elements of the business. I'd yeah. say that's that's a business win. For sure. Like, look, historically, AEW has done a fantastic job over its ever since it started. It, it's overachieved in like any reasonable expectation of like from what you would have expected from day one to right now. Um, and sure, they have had higher highs than they're at right now. Um, and they obviously want to get back to that. But like their numbers right now in general. I, 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 we're saying this after the Rampage rating discussion and everything, but in general, their numbers are good. Um, you know, they were expected to get half a million viewers at first for, for Turner when they debuted, and they blew that out of the water by getting, for initially, over a million viewers. And on a weekly basis, they are around, what, 900K, if I'm recalling correctly, on a, for, like, the past couple months uh, yeah. for, for Dynamite. Like, that's still good. That's good. Um, And and you can talk about wanting like their second um, second million viewers. And like that's a great goal to have. But how many TV shows in general have two million viewers? Like outside of uh, sports, it's not that many. So specifically cable network television. Yeah, on cable. Completely different beast. Obviously, because you don't have the the gateway to pay for the channels. Yeah. but I mean, really, you know, this there's, you know, I'm going back to the gentleman's uh, wrestling podcast uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a lot of like people that just view everything through the lens of the Monday Night Wars and what TV was like back in 1999. And shockingly, almost 25 years later, it's a different business. This may shock you, but, you know, cable is having a hard time keeping viewers, uh, subscribers. Mm-hmm. And TV channels or TV shows in general are having a hard time keeping people's eyeballs. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is a great deal for them. And anyone that is doing serious assessment of AEW, I think, has to say that it's good news for them. There's no other way to really look at it. Yeah, uh, let's let's continue on with the conversation sure. about AEW. And this is from um, Joe Gagne, who hosts the Five Star Match Game on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. And he asks, if AEW gets a sizable rights increase in the lengthy renewal of Warner Brothers Discovery, will the more negative discourse surrounding the company ease up at all? And I think this is interesting because it's, I think a lot of the negative discourse comes mainly from bad faithers. But you also have other individuals in the media landscape who are a little concerned about the long-term prognosis of the company. And I think you kind of just alluded yeah, to we, that we're kind of dovetailing here yeah which is why i think this is a perfect lead-in i i think that they're going to end up like if i had to guess i think they're going to end up re-signing and i wouldn't be shocked if they got close to like 80 to 100 million per year um but they're also getting more programming which we know that they were getting i think it was a 45 it was either 45 million over the course of three years or 45 million a year for each of the the next three years. I think it was 45 million total. Um, But that was after their initial deal where all it was, was an ad revenue split and production. And they tore that that deal up real quick, like after three months or something. Mm. Yeah. um, They, they signed a new deal because that deal was signed in September of 2019 by like, I think it was mid February of 2020, right before the pandemic, AEW got that new deal. And I think that was really smart of Warner Brothers Discovery. Hey, we have a successful product. After it leveled off, we've seen that this is going to get some kind of substantial consistent ratings. So now let's give them a little bit of money. So then we're putting our faith in them. And then when the next round of negotiations come around, we're going to be acting in much more good faith, which can help us save money even more in the long term. Yeah, and I mean... 
I think it's pretty obvious, especially after this, that it's the two way street between the two companies is generally very positive. Like it's easy to get hung up on like the Briscoe not uh, being allowed on TV situation or other aspects of things, but in general, it's good. I think uh, Turner values AEW as a product. They and if you go to their websites, um, this is something Rich Krejci brought up. But I'm going to go to TNT uh, uh, drama.com, and the first thing I see is a promo for the NBA, and then the second thing I see is a promo for AEW Rampage. Uh, obviously, they they don't want to carry wrestling, and they are on the verge of killing it off. I'm being sarcastic. They're <laughs> they're, they're very happy with the product. Um, they promote it regularly, especially in their NBA games, and um, it's a big part of what they are doing right now. Um, and I think any other read of it is just not fact based. Um, I don't want to call everyone who like reacts like AEW's on death's door as a um, or like has otherwise negative views of it. Uh, in terms of like its business as bad faith, there's a solid chunk of those people. But I also think some people just don't know or understand what they're talking about. And I think it's a lot of ignorance. And, uh, you know, some people, the ignorance is on purpose. And some people, they're just, they don't know what they don't know. Absolutely. And that is why you come to listen to the good, the bad, and the hungry, where we never approach things with bad faith. <laughs> uh, everything I say is correct and intelligent. Well, that's that's because you almost beat the number one Scrabble player in the world. Well, that's a different matter. But um, <laughs> we have one more question, though, Fred, before we get out of here. Um, this is from WC. All of these uh, came from the Voice Wrestling Discord. If you want to ask us a question next week or in the future, join the Voice Wrestling Discord and jump in our channel, The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry. It's toward the top with a group with all the other great podcasts on the network. Um, with an Iron Man match on the Revolution card, is uh, this an opportunity to establish the pay-per-view live rampage as a place to blow off mid-card feuds? He gives an example like Swerve versus Keith Lee or Stokely versus Hook. I, I think that's a really good idea, especially because you can't get everything on the pay-per-view. And it's it's a good way to sell your pay-per-view by giving like a really hot style match. Um, but we also know that Tony Khan has a tendency to not want to put his best foot forward on go home shows because they don't make you money. Um, and he says that he has the data to back that up. Where are your thoughts on this, Fred? You know, uh, I think that they should be doing more storylines in general with the lower card. I think they should, you know, it should be like uh, back when Saturday night, uh, WCW Saturday night had some like specifically contained to that show storylines among the lower card guys when it was a lower priority show after the creation of Nitro. Uh, the fact that there isn't really much, I mean, there's some, but there aren't like well established feuds on Dark and Rampage. Um, I think hurt those shows. Uh, another thing that has really stuck in my crawl recently over Rampage when I've been thinking about it is the fact that Rampage ha always has the same format. It is a very uh, predictable show. Um, it's always pretty big opening match. Then you've got yourself uh, a promo. Then you got yourself a... Uh, you know, like a, a short mid-card match. You got yourself probably some other video package, then a squash, and then you do the Mark Henry promo to set up the main event. And at some point in there, Excalibur gets 30 seconds to blurt out like 18 things. Um, and it always feels like the same show. And they, they really need to move away from that. I think that really makes the show feel unimportant. It does. It's not a good vibe when I can uh, pretty much visualize what the show is going to be like once if i just know what the three of the matches are even um and i think that does hurt rampage quite a bit yeah uh, i'd be very intrigued to see if tony wants to approach that especially one of the things that's interesting is they've been like especially with the all out weekend there was a lot of conversation about how all out hadn't officially sold out yet because they were trying to sell those like trio packages of tickets mm -hmm. one to dynamite one to rampage and then one to uh, all out well they were having difficulty selling those packages and i think one of the reasons being is because we have like 
do it. Who wants to go to Rampage is was the thing then, even when well, it was a fire show. It well, it also multiple reasons. One, a lot of people fly in for all out. Two, if you fly in for all out, are you really flying in Wednesday morning to stay until Monday morning? Right. It's a long wrestling vacation. And it's not like, hey, um, I was trying to uh, get a suite for um, full gear when it was in Minnesota, but they wouldn't sell suites unless you were buying a suite for Rampage too. I'm like, I'm not swinging that. That's that's no, a lot man. of money. But that's a lot more palatable because Rampage and full gear were back-to-back days. So as far as like a wrestling trip, okay, that makes some sense. And I, I can understand packaging those two together. But when you're talking about packaging like all three days – and with a Sunday pay-per-view, that's a lot. And I'm very intrigued to see like kind of how he ends up building this one out and seeing like, Hey, am I really concerned about my, like, cause they're doing, I believe I, I know rampage is in the cow palace. I think dynamite is there too. And then they're, they're going to be, it's at the chase center for the pay-per-view um, just across the bay. So I'm I'm very intrigued to see how they handle all of this. Um, I would like to see a little bit more on Rampage the right before, but based on Tony Khan's prior booking, I'm not expecting anything. Yeah, but they they, I mean, the show is what it is, and they need to change the show. <laughs> they need to shake it up and give it a jolt. And uh, you know, when your show's ratings is failing, just sticking with the the hand you have just doing the same thing over and over is not going to work. Um, yeah. And I've, re- I've, we've spoken about the issues with rampage and I've written about them before. Um, it's just very frustrating and I don't foresee like anything really changing much with it, but hopefully it does. We'll see. Um, Fred, that is it for our show here today. Any final words for the people before we take off? Uh, not particularly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm boring, and uh, I just want to go eat something. You and me both. So you can follow me on Twitter at the Real Forno and at the Vikings Wire, where I cover the NFL draft and the Minnesota Vikings for USA Today. You can follow Fred at Flagrant Wrestling, R at not W, um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Good Bad Hungy. You can email us at hungypod at gmail.com where you can ask us questions, give us any feedback. You can also do so, as I mentioned earlier, in the Voices of Wrestling Discord. If you are listening on the Voices of Wrestling podcast feed, thank you very much for supporting us and all the other great shows on the network. If you want to keep supporting us, please subscribe to our individual uh, feed, the good, the bad, and the hungy to help us continue to grow the show and show our bosses that we are doing a good job. For that, for Fred, the Hungy Cat, and Odie, and myself, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.